Good evening and welcome to our annual Memory and Mobility Update. As always, hello, Marilyn. <laughs> That's okay. As always, it is um, it's an honor for us to talk with you and to share about research in neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, ALS, Huntington's, and other rare types of neurodegenerative diseases. I know we're all in this room because we care about this topic. Um, so uh, before I turn it over to our speakers, I want to say a very special thank you to Twickenham Advisors. Um, Twickenham Advisors has been a supporter, the presenting sponsor for this event for many years, and we couldn't do this at no charge um, without their support. And so, Wes, everybody on your team, we thank you and we appreciate you. So now, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sarah Sharman. And you all may remember, Sarah moderated our program last year, did a wonderful job. We heard lots of good feedback, so we decided we're going to do that again. Dr. Sharman is our um, manager of research communications. Um, she has a PhD. She is very well versed in science. And she's also the co-host of the Tiny Expeditions podcast. Raise your hand if you have listened to a Tiny Expeditions podcast. Okay, some of you. We need all hands to go up for that. It is, it is one of those fantastic resources that Hudson Alpha has on our website, and you can find it at uh, hudsonalpha.org on our website. The podcast is called Tiny Expeditions. They have five seasons, and the fifth season just released very recently. So I encourage you to check that out. I think you'll find it very informative and entertaining as well. So Sarah, there's a plug for the, for the podcast. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, and I'm pleased to be back here with you guys for another installment of the m, &M Update. Um, I hope we've put together a very engaging, educational, and entertaining program for you all tonight. Um, before we get started, I want to introduce our panelists. Um, directly to my left, we have Dr. Rick Myers, Hudson Alpha's Chief Scientific Officer and MA Loya Chair in Genomics. Next up, we have Faculty Investigator, Dr. Nick Cochran. To Nick's left, we have um, Postdoctoral Fellow, Dr. Bree Rogers. And last but not least, we have Senior Scientist, Dr. Ben Henderson. Um, I'm going to facilitate Q&A with these panelists, but before we get there, we wanted to show a little video to really get the night going and fill you in on what we're going to be talking about tonight. So if you'll turn your attention to the screen. Witness the miracle of a baby's first step. A spark ignites in the brain, a symphony of neurons fire, and a lifetime of movement begins. The human brain is one of the most complex systems in the known universe. Weighing only three pounds, this unassuming organ orchestrates everything that makes us human. It allows us to think, feel, create, and dream. Imagine your brain as a giant communication network. The key players in the network are neurons. The brain contains more than 86 billion neurons that connect together to form a staggering number of interconnections. These tiny cellular messengers send electrical and chemical messages back and forth, conducting thousands of functions and processes that keep our bodies working normally. The intricate symphony of electrical signals and chemical neurotransmitters give rise to the greatest wonder of all, human consciousness. While the brain may be a marvel, it's also a fragile ecosystem. When things go wrong within the intricate brain network, a person can lose the very essence of their personality individuality, and abilities. Imagine a brilliant artist slowly forgetting how to hold their paintbrush, a task once second nature to them. This is the heartbreaking reality for the more than 7 million Americans living with neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS. These diseases have a devastating impact, not only on the individuals themselves, but also on their loved ones and caretakers. These diseases are not a normal part of aging. They result from irreversible damage to the brain. While age is an important risk factor, there's more to the story. Scientists are on a mission to discover the mystery of how and why 
neurodegenerative diseases occur? Is it a protein gone rogue? A cellular malfunction? Or a change in our genes? Here at Hudson Alpha, we have some of the brightest minds dedicated to unraveling the genetic anomalies behind these diseases. Tonight, you have the incredible opportunity to hear directly from four of our leading neurodegenerative disease experts. They'll delve deeper into the science behind these conditions and share the groundbreaking work Hudson Alpha is doing to fight for a brighter future. What a fantastic reminder of how complex and important our brains are. Nick, can you get us started and elaborate a little bit on the role of neurons in our brain's function? Absolutely. So neurons die in these neurodegenerative diseases, but for normal brain function, I think our, our narrator walked us through really nicely how important neurons are. So neurons operate through a combination of electrical and chemical systems and give rise to everything that you've experienced or remember. Um, and in a, in a time when we're talking a lot about artificial intelligence and there's a lot of enthusiasm around that, uh, we're talking about with, with the human brain, the real thing, the original thing, right? And, uh, and so that's uh, what we wanna study to preserve um, that, that important function. Thanks, Nick. So most of you have probably picked up, but damage to neurons is called neurodegeneration. The video mentioned a couple of diseases that belong in this classification of neurodegenerative diseases. Rick, can you elaborate a little bit on which ones Hudson Alpha studies specifically? Uh, sure. Um, we, we really work on, a, on six of them and occasionally work a little bit on some others. <clears throat> the major ones are Alzheimer's disease, which is the most uh, common one and is uh, you'll hear some numbers uh, as well. Uh, Huntington disease, that's actually the first disease I worked on, and we still do. Uh, that Parkinson's disease, really important one, also much more common than Huntington's, but not as common as, as uh, Alzheimer's disease. And also, uh, I think we'll probably, this will be true for probably everybody in the room, uh, near and dear to me, because that's what my father uh, had. Uh, uh, and then ALS is another big one. We've been, and you'll hear some about uh, both what the disease is and how the work that we're doing on it. Thanks, Rick. Bree, do you mind briefly describing some of the common symptoms of these diseases? Yeah, so the most common one you might think of is memory loss, but for some of these diseases, they may have the first symptoms of motor issues or uh, trouble moving, like tremors or behavioral differences that arise early on. Thanks, Bree. So the video touched a little bit um, on this, but besides the physical symptoms that we've described, Ben, can you hit on how else these diseases impact the lives of patients and their caregivers? Yeah, so just beyond the um, symptoms that the patient has, there are also, you know, emotional and physical tolls that it takes on the patient and the caregivers. And so this is uh, a pretty big deal because, you know, there are estimated to be over 11 million caregivers um, uh, treating people with Alzheimer's alone, and these are close family members. So I think it's important to remember uh, it's not just the, the patient themselves, but the people taking care of them. And so this comes at a great cost, both emotionally and then just from time, uh, the annual Alzheimer's facts and figures estimated that this cost upwards of $350 billion a year in, in caregiver time. So that's something we really need to be cognizant of as well. Absolutely. Thanks, Ben. Um, so let's dig a little bit into some science. Nick, can you talk a little bit about what actually causes the damage in the brain in these diseases? Absolutely. So. What, what happens in these diseases, we've talked a lot about age as a risk factor, um, and there are some key changes that happen with age, and they, they tend to point back to some really important proteins um, that, are, uh, they, that go wrong in, in disease and form aggregates. Uh, they are these highly expressed proteins um, that form aggregates that can build up inside of cells, um, and that's associated um, with a, a lot of decline and eventually cell death. 
So these uh, proteins can include things like amyloid beta and Alzheimer's disease, um, tau and diseases called tauopathies, including Alzheimer's disease and other rare diseases, um, alpha-synuclein and Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies, and TDP43 um, in ALS and also some forms of frontotemporal dementia. So those are really our starting point in understanding these diseases. And it gets a little more complicated in that while those diseases that I mentioned for those particular proteins are the most characteristic, sometimes there's a mixture of those that's non-characteristic. So all of us are individuals, and with aging, that picture gets messier and messier, where there are times when you can even observe all four of those abnormal pathologies in the same brain um, of someone with a, with a specific disease. So um, it's, a, it's a difficult picture with aging, with these things that go, that go wrong. Those are some of the key things, but there's lots of other things um, that people study in particular as well. So how are the effects of these changes different than just normal age-related problems? Right, so how is this different from just normal aging? Um, so what we, what we heard from our narrator in the video is that this is beyond uh, what happens in normal aging. Um, so all of us, I've, I've got bad news for you. Um, one day, you're going to die. Uh, so, uh, so all of our cells have a, have a limit, right? And, um, and many cells in our body, they renew um, fairly regularly, like our skin cells are renewing all the time. Um, some cells, what you, what you get is what you've got with some minor exceptions, and, and neurons are in that category. What that means is that over time with normal aging, there are going to be neurons that die at a certain rate, um, and we expect that, we know that's going to happen. But sometimes there can be something that accelerates that process. And when that happens, if enough of that happens, you can result in, in, that can result in neurodegenerative diseases. And if that process starts in a certain part of the brain, it may lead to Alzheimer's disease. If it starts in a different part of the brain, it may result in Parkinson's disease. So, um, so this is the, you know, how these things happen can lead to different disease presentations. Thanks, Nick. <clears throat> so family history is an important factor when you're discussing certain neurodevelopmental diseases. Rick, can you talk a little bit about genetics as a risk factor for neurodegenerative disease? Sure, sure. Um, I think, I, I imagine many of you, if not most of you, have been to Hudson Alpha maybe, maybe a bunch of times, and you probably have heard us talk about genomics, genomes, genes, and genetics. If, if you have heard those, mind raising your hand, I just want to see if I'm right about that. So yeah, okay, good. All right. Um, so so what, what we're interested in, and we have expertise in actually studying our genomes, our genes, that's what Hudson Alpha, when we started 16 years ago, that was one of our major things in trying to understand um, um, uh, how to actually read our genomes and read it. And, uh, and many, many, many people, when we first started here, there was like one or two people's genomes. Now there are tens of millions of people's genomes. The technology, everything got so good. It's really, really valuable to be able to do that. So in doing that, we actually look at the genomes, the genes of people who don't have disease and compare those to people who do have a disease. And we've done that, and that's a lot of our expertise and many other people around. Uh, and so basically what we know for, uh, so when you say something is genetic, that means you, 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 it's something that you, is in your genome and it's passed on to your children. You, that's typically what we mean, uh, uh, almost always. And there are some of these diseases, including the complex ones that we're, we're talking about, that are relatively simple genetically. Huntington's disease is caused by a mutation, a, a mistake in one gene. Genes are DNA, they code for proteins, so the Huntington protein is messed up when you have the Huntington mutation. And like Nick just said, uh, the protein precipitates in cells and it aggregates and, you, and then you end up getting cells dying. That's in a very specific deep part of the brain. You get movement disorder and other things happening as well. Um, but for, for Alzheimer's disease, is that eight or nine genes or some number like that now that have been found, including some that we've, we've contributed a big way to, where if you have a mutation in that, you, you will get Alzheimer's, either 100% or almost 100% of the time you would 
with age. I mean, it takes time. Um, those are really, really rare forms of Alzheimer's. I don't know what percentage Nick will know this, but Nick and Ben will know this better that, uh, and Bree, that um, it's a small percentage of all Alzheimer's is from those, few, those genes. We really want to understand the rest. I, I am getting to a point here, but bear with me, okay? Uh, 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 Parkinson's disease, uh, similarly, there's, there's quite a few genes, but most of the cause of, uh, of, of, of um, uh, Parkinson's, we don't know the particular single gene, or it's not due to a single gene. Similarly, ALS. ALS is actually one where there is a single gene that it's about 20% of, of, um, of uh, ALS, uh, and the, but most of them are other genes. So that sounds complicated, but because it is, it really helps when we find the single genes, because even if that's only for a small subset of people with it, it teaches us a whole lot about what can go wrong with those neurons and why they go wrong. So those, those rare forms are extremely valuable for us making advances on the more common forms. And then I have one more point to make, which is, what about the other 98% of Alzheimer's or, or, or of Parkinson's? What, what are they caused from? We'll maybe mention a little bit. There can be some environmental influences, not necessarily causes, but influences. Um, and what we do know, and this is what a lot of expertise in Hudson Alpha works on, is that there are many diseases, including things like autoimmune disease, et cetera, not just brain diseases, where it's a combination of several and maybe even a bunch of genes. And so that makes it a lot harder to study, but it doesn't make it impossible. And that's what a lot of our work is, has done as well. I said I was going to say one more thing. I'm going to now say one more thing. <laughs> there, it's one thing about a, 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 when, when we, we, we say proteins are encoded by genes, when you have a mutation in a protein like the ones we just described, it can be bad news. Uh, it turns out they're also uh, a part of what the way biology works is not the protein itself, but the part of our genome that controls whether that gene gets turned on or not. And so that's actually what I've been doing since graduate school is studying how genes get turned on and off. Bree's graduate work and some of her work she'll talk about it is that those are a little harder to study and yet we have a lot of expertise in this. This is kind of in our bones, I think. What we, uh, combining that with studying the genes themselves is really helping us get towards how we might do something about it, for instance, but certainly increasing our understanding. Okay, she'll shut me up now. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. So we obviously can't do anything about our age or our genetics yet. Ben, are there any steps people can take to promote brain health regardless of their risk for these diseases? Yeah, so uh, first things first, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm not a physician, but I think one thing that holds true when we look in the literature and, and see what people are, are looking at is uh, you know, the adage that you know, a healthy heart leads to a healthy brain. And so you know, as we age, doing things uh, that promote cardiovascular health, I think, is very important. So, you know, trying to get, you know, somewhere around 30 minutes of, of you know, vigorous uh, physical exercise every day, uh, eating a healthy diet, you know, we all hear about the Mediterranean diet. So eating, eating something uh, fresh and healthy every single day, uh, limiting uh, alcohol intake, you know, um, not cutting it out completely. Uh, that would be very hard for, for some of us. Uh, but... Um, uh, you know, keeping that in check, you know, staying away from smoking, uh, things like that, you know, I think are all very important, you know, staying uh, mentally active as you age, you know, uh, keeping your brain working, keeping active in, the, in, in that manner, I think is very important uh, as we grow older to try and, you know, prevent or, or mitigate, you know, neurodegeneration in our, in our own lives. Thanks, Ben. Um, so this was just a little bit of baseline knowledge for you all to get you started for the second half of our discussion. Um, we do have one more video that we want you all to watch, and then we'll come back to the Q&A. Imagine waking up tomorrow with a troubling fog in your mind. You know something isn't right. But unlike the flu, where a doctor's visit offers a clear path to recovery, the world of neurodegenerative diseases presents a different challenge. 
These conditions are a profound mystery to science. We still grapple with fully understanding them, let alone effectively treating or curing them. Yet researchers around the world are relentlessly pushing the boundaries of knowledge, determined to solve these problems. Take Alzheimer's disease, for instance. It is the most common neurodegenerative disease projected to affect an estimated 8.5 million Americans by 2030. This staggering reality has fueled a tremendous collective effort to discover treatments or cures. Studies estimate over $42 billion has been poured into private funding for Alzheimer's drug development in the United States over the past 25 years. An estimated 95% of drugs fail to reach the final approval stage for Alzheimer's disease, and there have only been five drugs that achieved FDA approval since 1995. Despite the immense time, money, and effort dedicated to Alzheimer's disease treatment, why do we only have a handful of drugs that merely manage symptoms of the disease? The road to effective treatments is riddled with obstacles. The diagnostic process is complex, often relying on a patchwork of tests to reveal the telltale signs of the disease. Differentiating Alzheimer's disease from other forms of dementia remains a challenge, which can impact the success of clinical trials. Another issue in developing new treatments for Alzheimer's disease is that researchers have historically focused on only a few targets. One fourth of the failed drugs were aimed at amyloid plaques, since these sticky clumps of protein are the defining feature of the disease. We need new targets for Alzheimer's disease treatments. Imagine a future where a simple blood test can detect a neurodegenerative disease in its earliest stages, where personalized medications precisely target the underlying causes of these diseases, where gene therapy offers the potential to rewrite the course of illness. The video alluded to the fact that there aren't a ton of options for diagnosing and treating neurodegenerative diseases. Let's start with diagnosis. Nick, what is the current diagnostic process for someone with a suspected neurodegenerative disease? So the current diagnostic process, okay, so again, I'll, I'll echo the, uh, I am not a medical doctor, um, so, but uh, that is the, the process that you need to go through. Um, and this process is not smooth for everyone. So um, it's really tricky because um, even if you're evaluated by the world's best experts, sometimes things are unclear. Sometimes they're quite clear, sometimes they're not clear. Um, and then especially if you're evaluated by someone who sees um, very generally lots of people with different neurologic diseases, um, they're doing their best, but maybe there's, a, you know, you, you've got a very specialized um, case of neurodegenerative disease. So um, it can be very difficult. There's, there's often this diagnostic um, odyssey. We, we see it with our childhood diseases, and you see it with adult onset um, neurodegenerative diseases as well, especially if there's a, a rare or atypical um, presentation. So it's, um, it's, it's tricky. Uh, often there's a process of seeing a local neurologist, maybe going to a specialist. Um, and, uh, and then um, we often still are relying on, on tools that are imprecise. And that's one thing that we're working on as a field is getting, getting better at being able to more precisely say what's going on. Thanks, Nick. Ben, why is it so important to diagnose these diseases as early as possible? So it's really important to diagnose as early as possible because, you know, we, we think about a lot of the uh, treatments for Alzheimer's that failed, right? So a lot of those failed, you know, m probably or, or partly because uh, the patients weren't identified early enough in disease state. They weren't treated enough early in disease state. So if we can begin the treatment process as early as possible, by diagnosing as early as possible, then these therapeutics may have a better chance at success. So, you know, we, we think about uh, some of the toxic proteins that build up in the brain. If we, can talk, if we can target those and, 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 and reduce those levels earlier, then they may have you know, less of a chance of, of leading to neurodegeneration or starting a lot of the cellular processes that we study uh, from, from starting, some of those cascades from starting. So it's really important that we work very hard to diagnose earlier in disease. So the video um, used a term, biomarker. Um, so 
Rick, can you talk about the potential benefits of a biomarker or a simple blood test for detecting these diseases? Sure. So what Ben just said is really important. The early, this is true for any kind of disease. Think about cancer. The earlier you catch it, the better chance you have of doing something about it, maybe even stopping it or, or, or preventing it from spreading. Uh, we have that. Ten years ago, it was a fantasy. It's now working where we work on taking blood from people with disease and with the, uh, without disease. And you're going to hear uh, a little bit later about a particular study that we've just initiated. Be actually, Ben uh, uh, Henderson and a fellow named Brian Roberts in my group uh, have been working on taking a little bit of blood and then looking at these in ALS. And I will say it's very exciting. There is a biomarker now. It's really a, a, a set of, of, of molecules that are highly predictive of, of ALS. We don't know if it's early on, if it takes early yet, but just having a, 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 a blood test, well, it, if you can detect it early, then you start treatments. Even when you don't have a treatment yet, there are drugs that are being developed. You can use this uh, to monitor whether that, that new drug is working or not. And in fact, the pharmaceutical industry the, the, or the companies working on these things very much need something like that, a companion diagnostic, so that they can know whether it's working or not. That's a really important step. And these didn't even exist a few years ago, uh, certainly not for, for brain or neurological disorders. Uh, and we've been pressing hard on this, and you'll hear about a, another one that, we, that we're just starting. But, uh, uh, and, and you would like it to be a blood test. It's almost non-invasive. You have to stick a needle in, but you're not, you're not doing some expensive thing where you're going, and you certainly don't take biopsies of, of, of brains. You just don't do that. But also the other alternatives, and Nick knows a lot more about this, are imaging tests, which are actually good for some things, not everything yet. Uh, th those are biomarkers too, but we don't have enough MRI machines in the world to test even a small fraction of people who ought to be tested. So, and not to mention that it's very expensive too. So we want to, we're, we're going to try to, we are trying to come up with an inexpensive test that then gets used in, in the clinic. And I don't know how close we are to the clinic on our, on our ALS one, but we're expanding that study in a big way. And you'll hear about Parkinson's a little bit later too. Thanks, Rick. Um, so Hudson Alpha is working on a couple of um, biomarker projects for neurodegenerative diseases. Rick alluded to some exciting results. Um, so Ben, can you talk a little bit about the ALS project and maybe share a little update about your exciting findings? Absolutely. Uh, so uh, we have been working on this project with the Crestwood Medical Center. So they have an ALS uh, Center for Excellence there. Uh, and so it's been really exciting because we've been working with them and we've been enrolling patients from within our own community that have ALS. So, you know, these are patients here in Huntsville, Alabama, and the surrounding areas that are having a direct impact on ALS research that we hope to publish. Um, and that's a really big deal. And so what we are interested in doing is, you know, we study uh, nucleic acids here. So that's what we do, DNA, RNA, that's what we, that's what we study. And so Rick's lab developed uh, this technique, you know, published a great paper in 2018 looking at, at, can at a cancer biomarker you know, by detecting nucleic acids in the bloodstream. So we want to apply that to neurodegenerative diseases as well. Uh, and so in this case, it's, it's ALS. So we are getting uh, blood samples from patients in the clinic here. Uh, we are extracting the nucleic acids from the blood, the RNA from the blood. Uh, and then we are doing sequencing uh, on those samples to try and identify certain species of, of these uh, RNA that uh, could be predictive or, or correlate with ALS disease status. Uh, and so, you know, our preliminary results are in from our, our sequencing discovery cohort, uh, which is about 30 ALS patients and, and probably double that in controls, which is important because that's a, a pretty large sample size for ALS. ALS is a very rare disease and it's really hard uh, to get patients to enroll in these kind of studies. Um, so this is a, a really powered uh, sequencing cohort. It's a very large cohort, like I said. And so we've detected a few different species of these RNA uh, circulating in the blood that correlate with ALS status. 
And so now uh, we are in the process of trying to validate that signature. Um, we call it a biomarker signature, biological marker. Uh, and so with the hope that, you know, this is something that can help predict uh, ALS disease. Um, uh, and it could, you know, have the potential uh, to help improve the diagnostic odyssey, like Nick talked about. It's very challenging with a lot of these neurodegenerative diseases. So anything that we can provide a clinician uh, with that may help them uh, to better diagnose a patient or stratify a patient based on a different uh, subtype of disease is a big deal. Uh, and then the other aspect of that is, you know, maybe it could, uh, you know, help with a lot of drug trials. So, you know, a lot of these drug trials target one specific thing and their readout is to, to measure that. So we need something that uh, could track disease progression or mirror uh, disease uh, status in these patients. And so that's the hope as well. Maybe it, it could help as a, if we call a pharmacodynamic response biomarker. So we're moving forward with it. We have some really interesting preliminary data and we're very excited and again, very excited to have been collaborating here in our home community uh, to get these results. That's so exciting, Ben. Um, hopefully we have another positive update at the m and event next year. Um, so in an ideal world, once someone is diagnosed with one of these diseases, they would receive a tailored treatment that would cure, slow, or halt the disease. We saw in this video that that's just not the case for a variety of reasons, including the lack of biomarkers to track drug efficacy. Um, I've noticed a lot of hype about a new FDA-approved Alzheimer's disease drug in the news lately, as I'm sure some of you have. Nick, can you fill us in on the basics of how that drug works and maybe what we're seeing now that the drug's available to actual patients and not just on a clinical trial basis? That's right. So. Um, each year, we've uh, talked about this, and many of you have probably been here before, um, we've touched a little bit, I think, on, on amyloid therapies or clearance of amyloid from the, from the brain, which is really important, um, a really important drug target in Alzheimer's disease. And there is now an approved amyloid therapy in the clinic, another one um, that's going through that, that process currently, um, that's, that's the same mechanism of action. And um, what, we're, what we're seeing is that's rolled onto the clinic is, is one, um, that there is a measurable effect, um, but it's, it's not as much as, you know, as, as we would all hope, because it's, it's one drug. And by the time you start treatment, a lot of damage has already been, been done. And that's, that's the reason why we need to treat as early as possible and have these biomarkers um, to maybe even start treating pre-symptomatically. Now, how the rollout is looking logistically is that, um, you know, the, the numbers are still in the dozens to scores of patients at a given medical center. It's very much still ramping up. Um, and uh, so part of what folks are working on as well is making formulations that can be more easily delivered in a home setting, things of that nature. So this drug targets amyloid plaques, and the video mentioned it, that we need more targets. Um, so why is it so important that we're exploring new targets for specifically Alzheimer's disease, but definitely other neurodegenerative diseases? Yeah, so uh, remember at the beginning I was talking about how complex these diseases are and how you can see multiple pathologies. Um, so beyond just the, the, the damage that's been done, there's also other damage that's been set in motion that may continue if you don't treat it as well. For Alzheimer's disease, for example, even if you completely clear amyloid beta, there's a secondary pathology from tau, and that can cont continue to spread independently and cause more damage, um, even in the context of a brain that's been completely depleted of amyloid beta pathology. Um, so a lot of the, the targets right now in Alzheimer's disease are clinical trials aimed at tau. Um, it's something that we're studying in the lab here at Hudson Alpha very heavily as well. Um, and, uh, and that's just one example of a combination treatment. You can imagine, you think about cancer, there's these combination treatments sometimes targeted for particular forms. And we wanna get to that point for neurodegenerative diseases and we're working on it, but we just have to have the multiple different types of treatments uh, to go after these things. Thanks, Nick. So we're obviously not in the business of developing drugs here at Hudson Alpha, um, but our work does have an important place in the drug development pipeline. 
Rick, how does the work that we're doing here at Hudson Alpha help move the field towards more treatments so that everyone with neurodegenerative disease have a safe, effective option? Um, that's a great question because, so what does it mean to develop a drug? Almost all drugs, I guess 98% or something, are pills that you take. Sometimes they're injected because they're big, big but they're small molecules that go in and bind to a particular protein that's bad, okay? Either to decrease that protein or stop it from doing whatever it's doing. Almost all of the 600 neurodegenerative diseases that we, those of the, uh, that class that we actually understand, have a protein that's doing something, it's kind of a toxic protein, a mutation, something causes that protein to actually usually aggregate and precipitate and form plaques and tangles or Lewy bodies or things like that. Even Huntington's disease has, has the, those kind of bodies as well. Now, think about what I just said. Those proteins are aggregating. If we didn't have the research figuring out from the genes what those proteins are coded, we wouldn't even know where to start. It'd be like throwing darts at a dartboard. And while uh, the, the advances that are being made are remarkable because we know these causes. So the drugs that and Nick has alluded to, the, the uh, amyloid protein is coded by a gene, and that protein itself aggregates, and that's where you get the, uh, the plaques and, and causes cells to, to die. So drugs have been developed against binding to, to, to bind to that protein to decrease the amount of that protein. So our research, I mean, the whole world is working on this, but our research is sometimes to find those genes, to figure out what the new proteins are. And for Alzheimer's, we would love to find something, and we have actually, we've found, but we would love for drug development to be starting to work on some of those other proteins since amyloid, it has worked some, but most of them have been failures. Uh, because of the complexity and drug development is hard anyway. So think about that for all the diseases that we're, we're working on. We'd like to do that. And if you'll bear with me, there's a new approach that we started a few years ago. It has not been <coughs> successful yet, although I'm, am I stealing your thunder here? Uh, Bree, is, Bree may talk a little bit about uh, her, her, her project, but we applied that, tried to apply this to Huntington's disease before she came to Hudson Alpha. Uh, the idea of, um, of actually not binding to the protein itself and inhibiting it, but binding to the gene and prevent it from ever being expressed. So binding at the DNA level. It's a lot harder. It's hard to think about doing this in different parts of the brain, but it's not crazy. It's not a crazy idea at all to be able to do that. So we study, remember I said gene, that we study how genes get turned on and off. That's one of the real applications for this. A lot of people are interested in this. It's not widely used yet because it's complicated, but I bet you you'll see progress being made in that. We certainly have made some ourselves. Thanks, Rick. Um, and that actually sets me up perfectly. Um, so Bree has recently uh, published a study looking at another target for Alzheimer's disease, the tau protein, which um, Nick mentioned earlier. Bree, do you want to briefly explain what y'all found um, and explain why this is an important step in finding new treatments for these diseases? Yeah, absolutely. So tau is really important across a variety of neurodegenerative diseases. Like Nick said earlier, these are called tauopathies. So we were really interested in understanding how tau is regulated. So how is it turned on and off? And so as Rick was saying, we wanted to find regions of the genome that are controlling tau expression or how much tau protein is made. And then if we find those regions, we can target them to reduce overall tau production, which would be beneficial for patients. So we actually found a, a few of these regions and they were previously unknown. So this is really exciting because these could be new drug targets in the future that may be more specific and last a little longer than the current uh, strategies we're using now that are in clinical trials. I hear that. Um Congratulations are also in order for you, Bree, um, with your new grant. Um, do you wanna talk a smidge about that and just introduce the other um, protein that you're gonna be looking at? Yeah, thank you. So I'm super excited about this and it's uh, news within the last two weeks, but so I recently received a fellowship from the American Parkinson's Disease Association and uh, that is to study alpha-synuclein. So you saw on the screen before, alpha-synuclein is the primary protein that makes up Lewy bodies that are involved in Parkinson's disease. 
And so we're taking what we learned from that tau project and applying those strategies to alpha synuclein. So now we can find those regions that are hopefully controlling synuclein expression, target those, and see if we can reduce synuclein and have that same beneficial effect that we see for tau for uh, synuclein, but now in Parkinson's disease patients. Great, thanks, Bree. So the road towards breakthroughs is often slow and full of roadblocks, but there are glimmers of hope along the way. Um, I just wanted all of our panelists to give us a little hope and tell us what they're the most hopeful about in neurodegenerative disease research for the future. Rick, do you want to start us off? Uh, sure. Um, and thanks for letting me go first. Because <laughs> I think we'll all... So <clears throat> when we started talking an hour ago, and a lot of you know this, it sounded, oh, this is a downer. This is a hard disease. It's affected so many people. <clears throat> That really hard. The brain is complex. Uh, I've been working on neurodegenerative diseases since 1985, so a long time. Uh, I'm, I've been around for a while. And I would have never said the word cure back then. I wouldn't have even said it 10 years ago. And I'm not really quite ready to say cure, but this is the most exciting time because we actually, these kinds of discoveries they're not just kind of in our minds that maybe this will work. They're actually leading to new candidates for drugs. People are trying them, and they, everybody realizes how important this is uh, for even the rare forms, but certainly the common forms as well. So my, my um, I don't know if I want to call it a dream because I think it's, it's stronger than that. My view towards the future is, first of all, I'm incredibly excited about seeing these jumps. Some of this is technology. There's new technology. You, some of you have heard us talk about where we can grow human brain cells by taking a skin punch and then turning those into, into brain cells or neurons. G Brie does that in the lab all the time and, and studies those. There are multiple, we can edit genes now. There those, all of those, the combination of those and many other types of technologies and then the discoveries we make while we're trying to study the specifics of these uh, make me think that uh, um, that... Uh, the future is bright. We're not, it's not going to be overnight. I think if, even if we can mitigate the disease, diseases and make them uh, less, less harmful, make, make you um, have a longer and healthier life in that, uh, that, will be, that, would, that would be wonderful too. And, and we're not talking about 20 years from now. The, these are happening now. Thanks, Rick. Ben, what about you? Yeah, so for me, I guess I look at this from you know a bench scientist approach. So what I am really excited about and what keeps me going is seeing all the new techniques that are, are being developed to study these diseases. Uh, there are so many more tools now that we, we have at our hands to ask the questions that we want to ask or ask the questions that are important. And these are extremely valuable tools uh, because it's like, like Rick said, it's leading us closer to you know, a, a cure, if you will, uh, each day. Uh, and so there's a lot of great science being done in the world right now. There are a lot of really good scientists developing these techniques that we are now all using to try to you know, cure these diseases. Uh, so that's what I'm really excited about, is, is all the technology that's being developed that we can now use. Thanks, Ben. Um, Bree, you're a little earlier in your career than the rest of the panelists, but what are you hopeful for? Um, yeah, so even in the short time that I've been in the field, it's really exciting to see how much more collaborative the, the Alzheimer's disease and neurodegenerative field has become. Um, so in years past, it's been the rush to be the first one and kind of in isolation. And I think we've learned that we get so much farther and learn so much more if we work together. And so I've been excited in with these new techniques coming out where we try them out. Maybe it doesn't work the first time, but people are very responsive now. And you can email or Twitter direct message and find out what the, the, the hidden secret is that, they, that gets that protocol to work now. And it's just exciting to see more of the field become more collaborative. And that really helps all of us to move forward for a common goal. And last but not least, Nick. Yeah, so I think 
My, my perspective is that I am really excited about a vision for the future on being able to really precisely target these diseases early. And what I, what I mean by that is this. So let me paint a picture of, of what's been happening in the past, what's happening now, and what I see in the future. So let's, let's back up 10 to 20 years ago. You go to a neurology clinic. Um, they may say, you know, your symptoms seem most consistent with Alzheimer's disease, um, but we're really not going to know until autopsy. Um, that's not very satisfying, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, now you, you fast forward to today, and that's no longer the case. Now there are very specific tests that if you have symptoms that are consistent with Alzheimer's disease, we can look at things in your cerebrospinal fluid, um, even now in your blood, um, and certainly with imaging, and have extremely high confidence that yes, this is dementia due to Alzheimer's disease, or no, it's not. This is dementia due to vascular dementia or dementia with Lewy bodies, et cetera. Um, and then there's things in development today that will get more precise for other diseases, things like imaging for Parkinson's disease. Now, fast forward to the future. In the future, now hopefully this is not 20 years, I think by 20 years we'll definitely be there, but maybe 10 years in the future, um, I envision that you walk into the doctor's office when you're 50 and you get some bad news, but it's got a silver lining. And the bad news is it looks like, based on your biomarker profile, that you are destined to develop dementia due to Alzheimer's disease by the time you're 70. You're 50, so you're, you're, you're you know, a little bit concerned about that. Uh, you know, what is my life going to look like? And they say, but good news. We have three drugs. We're going to start administering them before you ever develop a symptom. And you're probably going to live to the end of your life without developing dementia symptoms. That's the, the vision that I have. And what we're doing here at Hudson Alpha, the biomarker development efforts, the genetic profiling, all of that is right in the middle of that vision to try and get to that point. Um, so that's the, the vision that I have for the future that I'm excited about based on the things that are happening today and many of the things that are happening both probably in the field but right here. Thanks, Nick. That was amazing. Um, so we have brought up biomarkers a lot today. Um, ben told us about the promising early stage results from his ALS study. Um, now I'd like to invite another special guest to the stage, um, Megan Cochran, the director of the Smith Family Clinic for Genomic Medicine. And she's going to discuss another exciting study we recently launched here at Hudson Alpha. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and as Sarah said, I'm Megan Cochran. I'm the Director of Clinical Education here at Hudson Alpha, and I also direct the Smith Family Clinic for Genomic Medicine here on campus. So at the clinic, we spend most of our time in the very rare disease world, seeing children and adults who have very, very rare versions of different conditions, things that affect maybe one in 100,000 to one in several million people. But we also look for ways to work with our faculty members here at Hudson Alpha. And one of the ways that we're most excited about doing that right now is with the launch of our Parkinson's disease biomarker study. So in collaboration with Rick and Ben, over the next several years at Smith Family Clinic, we're going to be enrolling 200 patients with Parkinson's disease, as well as 200 patients or 200 controls who don't have Parkinson's disease, right? Because anytime we do science, just as important as figuring out what's wrong is figuring out what, what's not wrong over here and have something to compare that to. So this is another opportunity similar to the ALS study where we are engaging with our local community and we have some community partners who have been incredibly helpful in getting the word out about this study, um, but events like this are another way to do that. So in your packet of information that's on your chair, you've got a flyer that looks a lot like this. Um, it says, do you want to help advance Parkinson's disease research? Um, and based on the demographics of the room, I'm guessing almost all of you are going to qualify for this study. Um, so, like I said, over the next several years, we are looking for 200 patients with Parkinson's disease. And that's at any age. So anyone who has been given a diagnosis by a neurologist of Parkinson's disease, we would love to come have participate in the study. At the same time, like I said, we need controls too. 
The study in our paperwork says 19 plus, but anytime we do science, we know the best controls are the people that are a pretty good match for our cases too. So ideally, what we would like to have is people who are pretty good age match for our cases. So that might look like spouses, it might look like siblings, it might look like good friends who are around the same age as many of our patients with Parkinson's disease. What it looks like is you make an appointment at the clinic right here on our campus across the street. You come in and meet with one of our genetic counselors to go over the, some paperwork. We'll get some information about your medical history and your family history. A quick blood test. If you go to doctors very often, this is not going to be very much blood. It's like three tubes. Um, and then the last thing we have everybody do is a, a little more interactive, and that is a sniff test. Um, so the sniff test, if we have anybody in the room with Parkinson's disease, you might have noticed that your ability to smell or distinguish between smells has gotten worse over time, right? So we know that's actually really, really common in Parkinson's. That's kind of an example of a biomarker. And so we actually have a test. Um, it's a scratch and sniff booklet that asks you to smell a bunch of different things and then tell us what that smells like. We can actually score you based on that and see how well you can or can't smell. Doing all of those things together takes about 30 or 40 minutes, and then you're free to go. So it's really not a huge onerous thing. We're not bringing people back over and over again. Um, but we do really, really appreciate those of you who have already come out and enrolled. I've spotted a couple of my folks here in the room already tonight. Um, and we're really excited, like I said, about the opportunity to do this with our community. Um, and you know, we always have people say, how can I help? How can I be part of this? Um, on the flyer, you'll see there's an email address as well as the phone number for the clinic. Now I will ask you, please don't all call tomorrow morning. <laughs> I'm trying not to have my admin staff all quit on a Friday morning because 300 people called. Um, but if you think you would like to participate in the study, please give us a call. Um, just calling does not obligate you to participate, but we'd be happy to chat with you, see if you're a good candidate for the study, and if so, get you on the schedule. Now, if everybody calls, we may be looking at August or September or October, but that's actually what we want. We don't want this to be just one moment in time. We want to spend the next few years learning more and engaging with this community. And if you have people that aren't here tonight who are friends, family, loved ones, um, especially those who are affected by Parkinson's disease, please feel free to tell them about this study and have them get in touch with us as well. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Um, so that concludes my portion of the program. Um, I just wanted to thank the panelists um, for being up here and answering all of my questions. Um, I hope you as an audience were entertained and learned something tonight. Um, on your flyer on the back side of that Parkinson's disease side, um, we put a couple of links if you want to learn more about any of these diseases that we talked about tonight or if you want to dig in on anything else that Hudson Alpha is doing in the neurodegenerative disease space. Um, and now I'm going to turn the program over to Elizabeth to close us out. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I didn't introduce myself. I think it's because I feel like I know so many of you. But I'm Elizabeth Heron, and I have the pleasure of leading the advancement team at Hudson Alpha. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank all of our distinguished panelists who, by the way, will stick around for a little while after the program. So if you'd like to come up and speak with them, they will be here. Um, when you came in tonight, hopefully you were asked to put a pom-pom in a jar if you or someone you know has been impacted by one of the neurodegenerative diseases you've heard about tonight. And so, um, this was a, a, a project we wanted to do to help you participate in this evening's activities um, so that we could learn a little bit more about you. So I'm going to tell you what those results are. So in the Alzheimer's jar, there were 142 pom-poms. In the Parkinson's jar, there were 122 pom-poms. In the dementia, frontal temporal dementia, and other rare types of neurodegenerative disease, there were 60 pom-poms. In the uh, ALS jar, there were 51. And in the Huntington's jar, there were 14. That's a total of 389 pom-poms. 
That's a lot. That's more than everybody in this room, which means that several of you put in more than one. So I'm curious, we played the raise the hand game a couple of times, we're gonna play it one more time, but um, if you put a pom-pom in the jar, in any of those jars, or if you happen to walk by it, you went straight to the cookies, no judgment, they're good, <laughs> right? Please raise your hand. Yeah, everybody look around. Keep your hands up just a second. Y'all look around. That is just about everybody in this room that has been impacted by neurodegenerative disease. So why did we do that exercise? Well, we wanted you to participate, but we, and I, I'm not a scientist, you all know that, but I include all of these scientists, these fabulous people, along with all of us who are part of Hudson Alpha, we want you to know, and I should have raised my hand because I didn't, my dad had Alzheimer's disease. We want you to know that we see you, we hear you, and we are you. What you've experienced and struggled with is important to us, and making a difference through scientific discovery so there, there are better outcomes in neurodegenerative disease is a mission of Hudson Alpha. It, what's, it's what drives us every day. It's why these people have studied so hard to become who they are and work so hard in our labs. The reason we're here is to give hope for a better tomorrow, and I know we all agree with that. And you all know that that's possible because of what you have done and, and the many ways that you have supported the memory and mobility program at Hudson Alpha. So many of you, as I look around this room, have donated either your time or your resources to the Memory Mobility Program. And I wanna say thank you very much. So can we give everyone a round of applause? I hope you see how your donations are making a difference. They really are. They are what drive us forward um, to make new discoveries and make new advancements. So if you have not yet donated to the Memory Mobility Program, I ask that you consider making a donation either tonight or sometime in the future. The Parkinson's Project that you heard Megan talk about was funded by a donation to the Memory and Mobility Program. It's what made that possible. We would like to do a program similar to that for Alzheimer's disease. Wouldn't that be fabulous? and it could be funded through donations to the Memory Mobility Program. So as always, we tell you that donations of any amount are tremendously appreciated and we promise to be good stewards of what you give and to continue to give you updates on how your donations are making a difference. So thank you. Before I close, I wanna remind you that um, as part of our 2024 event series, our next event is on August the 20th and our very own Dr. Neil Lamb, Hudson Alpha's president, is going to be um, talking with you and giving his update. And that you won't want to miss that. So it's at 5.30 here at the Jackson Center. It's a free event. Please go ahead and put it on your calendars because if you were here last year, you know that we filled both halls with that event for Dr. Lamb. Once again, we're grateful that you came tonight. It's our honor to share the work that we're doing. We wish you all a very pleasant evening and good night. Thank <laughs> you.